Cycling in Britain has never been more popular. With international events like the Tour de France and the Tour of Britain making the headlines, and even the Prime Minister calling for a cycling revolution, there are now more bikes on Britain's roads than ever before. And I just want other people to enjoy the, the gift of cycling because it's a great thing to do. But this surge in cycling has come at a deadly price. Oh, fuck off! In 2013 alone, 14 cyclists tragically lost their lives in the capital. Cycling casualties are all too common on London's roads, but could that be all about to change? I'm Rachel. I've lived in London pretty much all my life, but I've never quite felt comfortable cycling on its busy roads. So in this documentary, I'm going on a journey to discover what's being done to make traveling on two wheels more appealing for people like me. I'll be meeting with cycling enthusiasts, road safety campaigners, and the Mayor's Commissioner for Cycling to investigate the essential work being done to safely accommodate cyclists on our streets. The day of the car in big urban environments is over. I'll even be visiting Amsterdam, a city that claims to have more bikes than people. But first, I met with the owner of a high-end bike club in Kensington, where I learned that cyclists are prepared to spend a lot of cash on indulging their passion for pedalling. A 10 grand bike. Yeah, 10 grand bike. That's an 11 grand bike. That's, yes. Are you joking? I could buy a car for 11 grand. You could buy a car. It wouldn't look as nice as that, would it? I asked Spencer who he thought was responsible for the safety of cyclists. You've got to think of yourself as being invisible. It's not for people to look for you, okay? because you're always going to come off worse. So you have to be aware and put yourself in a situation to be safe. I was surprised to learn that Spencer wasn't a great fan of cycle lanes. Cycle lanes are the worst thing ever. There's, we've had more accidents actually of, of clients on cycle lanes because there's no rules. So basically you get runners running down, who headphones in. There's not really a division of which way it's going. There seemed to be a whole community of cyclists in London that I was never really aware of. I'd been told about a huge monthly cycling event called Critical Mass, and despite my nerves, I couldn't wait to get involved. So I took out a Barclays bike and headed down to Southbank, where I caught up with some of the cyclists. Why are you here tonight? Um, I think uh, every last Friday of each month is just for time for Londoners to come and cycle together. I do think it can do a big thing for showing that cycling has a voice and an important voice in the city. If you ride around like everyone's mad and you'll survive, it's not too bad. Everyone was so enthusiastic about cycling in London, but they all seem to agree that cyclists aren't properly catered for on the roads. There does need to be more space for cycling. More cycle lanes, definitely more cycle lanes. Well, cycle lanes that don't end in the middle of the road, you know, in the middle of nowhere. A lot of the drivers, they just haven't got a clue, basically, and they just don't understand what it's like. Cyclists are here, they're here to stay, and that we have a place on the roads and that we shouldn't feel we sort of shoved off onto the tiny little, often not very good cycle lanes on the left-hand side. Riding alongside thousands of cyclists definitely felt empowering, although I couldn't help but feel for some of the frustrated drivers we were holding up. So I stopped to speak to a few of them to let them vent their anger. Are they stopping at red lights or are they just jumping the red lights like they normally do? <laughs> I can tell. So you... I hope they've all got lights and crash helmets on as well. They've got no special training to ride on the roads. But London is a busy city, we shouldn't have all these bikes on the road, they are a danger. I'm happy they are there, yeah, but they should follow the rules. They should stop with the traffic lights, like everyone has. I really love the critical mass, and to be honest, it was quite moving to see cycling unite so many Londoners. But it was made very clear to me that these people didn't feel safe or respected on London's roads. The next day, I arranged to speak to former Times journalist and cycling campaigner Ed Gorman, where I learnt just how devastating cycling accidents can be. But it was brought home to us very vividly when one of the um, most talented young journalists at the Times, Mary Bowers, was um, very tragically caught up in a bad uh, accident with a lorry 
uh, which inflicted very severe head injuries on her, from which she's making a very slow recovery, unfortunately. Gosh. And um, that was a, that really was a catalyst where we decided that uh, it was time to try and do something about it. What stops people from wanting to make yeah, cycling absolutely. safer? Is that we are so far behind, and it feels like there's a Himalayan peak to climb here, which is going to cost millions and millions and millions of pounds. They just can't face the huge upheaval in the infrastructure. It was clear that something had to be done for people like me to feel safe enough to take to the streets on two wheels. So I arranged to meet with passionate cyclist and renowned campaigner Donica McCarthy, who told me that investment in cycling infrastructure is key to making our roads safer. What Boris needs is, is an urgency about this. We need to get cracking and invest real money in this. If he's talking about 30,000 million from one road, why can't we have 30,000 million for all roads in London to be helped to be cycling safety? So that's what we want to get him from the message, is the urgency for everybody in London that all our quality of life, all our health is dependent on doing this. So you think if Boris put the money in, the people would come and people would start cycling and there'd be a real change of life really, change of lifestyle. I guarantee it. The question is, can we take on the existing car culture and their power? Donica told me about ghost bikes, the poignant way cycling casualties are remembered in London. When there's a tragedy, um, the cycling uh, community has just started to me memorialise them by actually painting an old bike white and placing it on the sign of the, of the killing. Um, to help remind people actually a price is being paid. It's around 14 cyclists a year die from, from crashes in London at the moment, a year. But there's 4,000 dying from traffic pollution, there's 5,000 dying from lack of fitness. So it's, to it's almost 100 times more, more dangerous not to cycle in London. Donica invited me to a protest he was organising called Stop the Killing. It sounded like this was an event not to be missed. So the next day, I headed down to Bedford Square where I watched protesters gracefully gather around a black hearse that symbolised the thousands of people that have lost their lives on our roads. I met Dominique, whose daughter's life was tragically taken from her six years ago. At the beginning, she was on a cycle path with her friends, mm -hmm. and suddenly the cycle path disappeared. She fell on the road, and the second car, which was very Closed behind, ran over her. She was dead. Well, I'm so sorry. I then spoke to former Deputy Mayor of London, Jenny Jones, and I was surprised to find a lot of hostility towards Boris Johnson. Who's the person sort of putting the brakes on? Well, I'm afraid it's Boris. I mean, really? he sounds passionate about cycling, and I suppose he's passionate about using his bike. That's not the same as understanding the problems that face the majority of people who would cycle if they thought it was safer. In fact, when Boris first started, he did ask me if I would be his cycling ambassador, and I refused because I didn't think he was going to give me any money to do it, and I didn't think, well, I didn't know him and I didn't trust him. Do you regret that now? Not in the least. The procession soon got underway and the hearse led us down Oxford Street, where we caused quite a stir. Well, six months ago now, I was uh, run over from behind by a lorry in central London. And uh, the guy, Donica McCarthy, was really, really helpful during my time in hospital. I had a month in hospital recovering and, um, you know, it's a miracle that I'm still alive. I was involved in a hit and run. January this year and uh, I came out of it basically with a broken hip, damage to my shoulder, those were the physical injuries, but mentally I was in a very dark place. Finally we arrived at Marble Arch where we were asked to lie down for 10 minutes in remembrance of the thousands of people's lives that were so devastatingly cut short by traffic violence. I was truly touched by this event, and it was clearer to me than ever that cyclists were sick and tired of their needs being overshadowed by the dominant car culture that rules London. So I decided to attend People's Question Time in Walthamstow to speak to the man in charge, but he didn't really answer my question. And um, Boris, we've got 4% of traffic on London's roads is cycling traffic. Why then is only 1% of the budget being spent on building new cycling infrastructure? Uh, there are parts of London, by the way, it's more than 4%. Uh, 
uh, you know, you get your, you get, go to Hackney in, in the morning, you know, it's like 50% of, of people uh, traveling are uh, going by bike. I think, I know that not everybody agrees, I think that's a fantastic thing. And I, I love the way that the London is curving and we're going to spend more, more money on it. As you can imagine, I wasn't completely satisfied with this answer. So the next day, I made my way to City Hall to confront the Mayor's Commissioner for Cycling. 24% of all traffic on the roads in central London in the morning rush hour is now bikes. Um, certainly don't get but are we spending 24% of our cash then, or of the Mayor's budget, on cycling? We're spending a vast amount more than we were. Um, obviously it's, uh, it's still probably it's not, not as much as it was. Uh, not as much as it should be, but, uh, but it's a hell of a lot more than it was. So how much cash are you actually spending on cycling? It works out about 100, 150 million a year on average, but uh, the biggest spend will be uh, next year when we are going to do fully segregated cycle superhighways through the heart of central London, two of them, one east-west, one north-south. We're reshaping 33 major junctions with segregated tracks. That's where cyclists get killed. I asked Andrew about TfL's Mini Holland program. Holland is the, uh, you know, the acme, if you like, of cycling provision. It's the, it's it's the best in the world by common consent, with the possible exception of Denmark. And um, we can't hope to get anywhere near that anytime soon because it's a, a completely different proposition here. London's a much bigger place than any Dutch city, um, but we can we can move towards it. I was really excited about the idea of a city built for cyclists. So the only thing left to do was to experience this epitome of a cycling city for myself and visit Amsterdam. But to benefit from the wonders of this cycling haven, I first had to get a bike. So I popped into Mac Bike Rental where I met Eric. Why is it sort of safer to cycle? somewhere like Amsterdam? Well, I think uh, the city provides, well, the entire country provides so many bicycle lanes and uh, the, the whole infrastructure is really adapted to cycling in this, this country. In this city, there's a lot of people who actually want to ban cars uh, completely from the city center because everything is cyclable. This is not a city, it's a, it's a village. Nowadays, like since a few years, you have these bakfietse, like these huge fietsen, and they toss all their children in to bring them to school. It was about time for me to get on my bike and explore the city. I felt so at home riding along some of the 400 kilometers of cycle paths the city had to offer. The facilities Amsterdam boasted really did put London to shame. Bikes were welcome everywhere, even on the ferry. And there were enough bike parks to store over 250,000 bikes. I met Tim Hoy, a passionate cyclist and frequent visitor of the city. Tim, you've cycled in both Amsterdam and London. Which do you prefer? Always, always Amsterdam, very clearly. It's just so much more relaxed and so much more safe, as you can see from our surroundings here. I asked him how London could become more like Amsterdam. Well, if the infrastructure's there, the rest follows. You have to lead by getting things right. It's like saying everyone take the bus and there's no bus service. It was clear that London was moving in the right direction, but there was still a lot of work to be done. I knew the locals wouldn't think much of our roads. <laughs> Fancy riding your bike around there? Uh, no, I would get, get a cab, I guess. Get a cab. Yeah. Would you cycle there? I wouldn't. <laughs> no. no, I wouldn't. Why? Because Why there's a lot of traffic. It's, it's very, very dangerous. Not enough, not enough room, not enough space. I wouldn't know where to go with my bike. That's the problem. In Holland, we have signs on the road where you should go with your bike. Yes, it is impossible. Don't do this. Okay. Yeah, I can imagine. This is not so easy, actually. Um, is, that a ca is that a taxi driver? That's a taxi. He but should he's... know how, what are the rules. <laughs> Sadly, my time in Amsterdam had come to an end but I realised that London could learn so much from that incredible infrastructure and accommodating attitude towards cyclists. And I realise now that our future really does lie in the hands of campaigners like Donica, Ed, Jenny and Dominique. Their voices are finally being heard and thanks to them, one day soon, we will all be able to enjoy cycling in a better, safer environment.